Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. I apologize that this particular video will not be super polished. I'm in a stretch of consecutive days in the hospital without much extra time, but it's it's been a, an eventful few weeks of COVID-related news. It seems like a horrible omission to not discuss any of it. Briefly, the bad news, and it's pretty bad. Unless you've been hanging with Jared Leto in the desert, you no doubt know that the world especially the United States, is seeing a massive surge in cases, and we are at the beginning of what is expected to be a devastating wave of deaths here. I'm not a fan of non-epidemiologists giving specific predictions, but having said that, it very much looks like the United States is going to be back to averaging 2,000 deaths a day, numbers not seen since April. And these are numbers as we are about to head into the Thanksgiving holiday. For non-Americans during our Thanksgiving, people traditionally have two to three days off from work to travel, sometimes great distances, for moderate-sized family reunions focused around the, uh, the indoor consumption of large amounts of food and loudly arguing about politics. For a country in the midst of a pandemic, it's the worst possible event coming at the worst possible time. But this is not the main topic of today. Instead, I want to talk today about some good news, essentially the first real good COVID news since dexa dexamethasone uh, was found to reduce mortality back in June. The first significant vaccine data is in the process of being released and reviewed, and it looks even better than scientists had hoped it would. I won't discuss the entire process of vaccine development and approval. That was covered in my last vaccine video from the summer. I'll put the link in the description. But I am going to focus on where we stand today with the three vaccines most likely to see early widespread deployment in North America and Europe. One developed by a company called Moderna. One by a partnership between Pfizer and the German biotech company BioNTech. And one by a partnership between AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford. The first thing to note about these vaccines is that they all use relatively new strategies for triggering an immune response. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both RNA vaccines, which are composed of synthetic messenger RNA that's essentially identical to the RNA from the SARS-CoV-2 virus that encodes its so-called spike protein. The spike protein extends out of the surface of the virus. It's the thing that is represented by the red bumps on this ubiquitous image. And more importantly, it's the protein responsible for the virus's ability to attach and invade the cells of our airways. By injecting people with just the genetic instructions for the spike protein, provided that our cells uptake the RNA and our cellular machinery is tricked into producing the spike protein from the foreign genetic material, if those things happen, our immune system will subsequently develop antibodies for the specific viral component that's responsible for infection. But since an RNA vaccine, it lacks the rest of the viral genome, there is literally zero risk of inadvertently transmitting infection from the vaccine. Also, although the, although the technology is newer and unproven, RNA vaccines, if they're successful, they can be produced at uh, much faster at large scales, which is very helpful during a global pandemic. However, there are disadvantages to RNA vaccines. First, as you may have already heard in the news, uh, they're not stable at room temperature and must be kept cold to remain effective, sometimes really cold. So like, for example, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine supposedly needs to be kept at negative 70 degrees Celsius, a temperature close to that of dry ice. It's not a problem for large hospitals, but a huge logistical problem for rural clinics and the developing world. Moderna claims that theirs is stable at a much more practical negative 20 degrees Celsius, which is similar to a household freezer. Another main disadvantage of RNA vaccines is that they haven't been used successfully before, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned already. Uh, this doesn't mean that they won't work and all the early data from COVID clinical trials is reassuring, but it is an unproven approach. AstraZeneca's vaccine is slightly more involved. It's a viral vector vaccine. In this strategy, a gene from the pathogen of interest is inserted into the genetic code of a much less harmful virus, which is then injected as the vaccine. 
To date, there is only one successful vaccine that uses this strategy, the Ebola vaccine, which was just approved by the U.S. last year. With AstraZeneca's COVID vaccine, how it works is there's a neutered version of a chimpanzee cold virus that was engineered to also encode the same spike protein. So ultimately, all three companies chose the same target protein around which to base the desired immune response. It's just the delivery mechanism that's different for one of them. So where are we with the data? The first company to release news was Pfizer, announcing two weeks ago that prelim data from their phase three clinical trial indicated their vaccine was more than 90% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID, which was later revised last week to 95% effective based on some additional data. Where does that number come from? What does it mean? Well, their trial randomized around 44,000 individuals to either vaccine or placebo. 170 cases of COVID have subsequently occurred among those 44,000, with the vast majority occurring in the placebo group, meaning the vaccine was very protective. The 95% is much higher than was expected and is phenomenally good news. As of two days ago, Pfizer has formally requested an emergency use authorization from the FDA for their vaccine. The FDA has scheduled an advisory committee meeting to discuss the request on December 10th, which supposedly will be broadcast live on Facebook and YouTube. Regarding Moderna's vaccine, last week they announced interim results from their in-progress phase three trial. They also randomized, in this case, about 30,000 participants to vaccine versus placebo, also with a primary outcome being symptomatic COVID-19. Coincidentally, they are also reporting a 95% vaccine effectiveness. Just as important is that of the 11 cases of severe COVID that were seen in these 30,000 people, all of them occurred in the placebo group. Moderna may submit their own EUA request as early as this upcoming week. For both these vaccines, another great piece of news is that the observed side effects so far have been just your typical local pain, aching muscles, and transient fatigue that can be seen with all vaccines. Where does AstraZeneca's vaccine stand right now? You know, they had very promising earlier clinical trial data and actually seem to be sort of like on the forefront of this, this whole effort. But unfortunately, their combined phase two, three trial isn't as far along as the others at this point because it was placed on a hold for about a month and a half due to a trial volunteer developing transverse myelitis, potentially due to a vaccine side effect. After a thorough review of the issue by uh, independent regulatory groups, uh, including the FDA, the trial was restarted in late October. Prelim results on its effectiveness are now expected by the end of 2020. So what are the unanswered questions here? There are five big ones. First, are these vaccines really as safe and effective as companies are claiming? So far, all of the phase three data that's been available to the public has been from company press releases. We hope that these companies are being honest and forthcoming. And to be honest, they, they probably are, since a major vaccine misfire would be a PR disaster from which a company would probably never recover. But with so much at stake, it's hard to be confident in that honesty. Second question, do the vaccines actually prevent infection or do they just prevent symptomatic COVID-19? Obviously, either one of those is good. No one is going to complain about fewer COVID deaths. But if they work by converting symptomatic individuals to asymptomatic carriers, that actually won't stop the pandemic from continuing to circulate through the population, still risking those who are unable or who choose to not receive the vaccine. Third, how long-lasting will immunity be? Will we be getting our one shot plus or minus a booster in a few weeks later and then be set for life? Or will we need to get annual COVID boosters for as long as the disease continues to exist? There is speculation on both sides of that question, but there's no way to know for sure without just letting months and even years pass while seeing what happens to people's antibody levels. The fourth question, when will the vaccine actually be made available to the public? In my last COVID vaccine video, I showed this graphic of how the vaccine timeline could be significantly sped up from the previous record of four to five years, 
with a goal of widespread availability in summer of 2021. Although there's plenty of speculation that it might be sooner, for people who don't have any particular priority in uh, vaccine allocation, the summer of 2021, it still seems like a very rough ballpark time frame. For healthcare workers in the U.S., it conceivably might be available to some of us even before the end of 2020, and almost certainly most frontline healthcare workers will be vaccinated from one of the three vaccines this winter. Uh, the elderly and those with significant chronic diseases like COPD or diabetes will also likely get it sooner. But it is still probably at least six months away for the majority of people. And the final big question is, how many people will actually take the vaccine once it's available? You know, I'm on the record as previously stating that I would be hesitant to receive a vaccine that appeared to have been rushed through the authorization process for purely political reasons. Given the FDA's recent track record with things like the uh, debatably inappropriate emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma, I'm less than enthusiastic about blindly trusting them that a particular vaccine is safe and effective. I am 100% pro-vaccine in general, but both the COVID vaccine and the FDA itself have been incredibly politicized. So while I am very optimistic about recent news, I still want to see the data. Having said that, I do anticipate being convinced by at least one of these three vaccines, if not all of them, and I do expect to be happily vaccinated in the next two to three months. I know many in, Mer uh, many in the American public are skeptical of the vaccines for a variety of reasons. Uh, some is distrust of the government, some is distrust of big pharma or vaccines in general. Uh, some is distrust from people who are still not convinced COVID is thing is a thing. Is is is, is it even real? Or that uh, is COVID even worse than the flu? There's just a lot of, of distrust based on misinformation. Certainly, physicians, scientists, science communicators, pundits, and politicians, you know, all of us are going to need to work together to convince the public that vaccination is the right, safe, and patriotic thing to do once we ourselves have been convinced. A vaccine with a 95% effectiveness, it doesn't mean nearly as much if only half the population is willing to take it. That's all I've got for this quick informal update. But before I go, I do want to come back to one thing I said at the beginning, which is that Thanksgiving is expected to lead to another COVID surge in the U.S., superimposed on the surge we are already experiencing. I know we are all tired of this. And while the end of the pandemic is not around the corner, with this vaccine news, we know that the light is at the end of the tunnel. Like, it is there. We can get to it. So please, for the Americans watching, consider celebrating Thanksgiving in your own homes with just your immediate family this year. You know, I'll be spending mine in the hospital while my wife will be making the world's smallest turkey for just her and our kids. You know, of course I miss my extended family and I, I miss holiday gatherings, but I know we can persevere a bit longer to keep our family and community safe. I'm just hoping that my next COVID update on here will be a video of me getting vaccinated rather than me discussing refrigerated trucks in our hospital's parking lot. That's it for today. Uh, hopefully I'll see you guys on here next week.